Hello, and welcome to Western Civ. Episode 228, Suleiman the Magnificent. Last week, Selim I finally consolidated Ottoman control over the Near East. The Egyptian kingdom of the Mamluks, which had stood since the 13th century, finally came to a brutal end. In a sign of things to come, Mamluk horse archers were simply no match for Ottoman firearms. The Ottomans were one of the few wholehearted adopters of this new military technology, and their edge in cannons would give them an undisputed advantage for the rest of the 16th century. Upon the death of the Sultan in 1520, everyone in Europe was left wondering not only who the new Sultan would be, but which direction he would take the Ottoman war machine. By Selim's death in 1520, it had been several decades since the Ottomans had made any real assaults on the West. With Sahavid Iran still independent, there were many in Europe who believed that this status quo would continue under Suleiman. As we will see, they were very, very wrong. By and large, Suleiman would seek to contain Iran, not conquer it. <laughs> I, who am the Sultan of Sultans, Sovereign of Sovereigns, Distributor of Crowns to Monarch over the whole surface of the globe, God's Shadow on Earth, Sultan and Padishah of the White Sea and the Black Sea, of Rumelia and Anatolia, of Karaman and the countries of Rum, Zal Qadir, Diyarbakir, Kurdistan, Azerbaijan, Persia, Damascus, Aleppo, Cairo, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, and all Arabia, Yemen, and many other lands, that my noble forebearers and illustrious ancestors, conquered by the force of their arms, and that my august majesty has also conquered with my blazing sword and victorious saber. Letter from Suleiman to Francis I. Quote, Sultan Suleiman has drawn near to God the Lord Majesty and Omnipotence, the creator of the world of dominion and sovereignty, he who is his slave, made mighty with divine power, the caliph, resplendent with divine glory, who performs the command of the hidden book and executes its decrees in all regions of the inhabited quarter, conqueror of the lands of the Orient and of the Occident with the help of Almighty God and his victorious army possessor of the kingdoms of the world, shadow of God over all peoples, sultan of sultans of the Arabs and the Persians, promulgator of the sultanic Huans, tenth of the Ottoman Khans, sultan son of the sultan, sultan Suleiman Khan. May the line of his sultanate endure until the end of the line of ages. End quote. Suleiman the Magnificent was one of the great kings of the age of early modern monarchs that we have, to an extent, already discussed. In 1509, Henry VIII came to the throne of England. In 1515, Francis I became King of France. The next year, 1516, Charles became the King of Spain. Four years later, in 1520, Suleiman became the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. A Venetian ambassador described his secession as follows, quote, Only twenty-five years old, tall and slender, but tough with a thin and bony face. Facial hair is evident, but only barely. The sultan appears friendly and in good humor. Rumor is it that Suleiman is aptly named, enjoys reading, and is knowledgeable, and shows good judgment, end quote. These four men dominated Europe for nearly half a century. All four were warrior princes, yet claimed to be lovers of peace, when it served their interests, of course. Suleiman would rule the Ottoman Empire for 46 years, longer than any other sultan. And he would lead his army on 13 different campaigns. The Ottomans, however, and this is undisputed in all the sources, European, Near Eastern, and everywhere in between, 
had the most powerful military in Europe. This would be the case for nearly two centuries, from the middle of the 15th century to the middle of the 17th. And the administration of the Ottoman Empire was essentially part of the military. Frankly, in times of war, just about everyone was part of the army in some way. Until the end of Suleiman's reign, the Sultan would be principally a war leader. Suleiman led the army himself, and he would be the last Sultan who would consistently do that. The discipline of the Sultan's army terrified the West at a time when European troops were equipped and armed in haphazard fashion, everything in the Ottoman army was standardized. In many ways, Europe had not seen a model army like this since the days of Imperial Rome. Just listen to one Venetian contemporary compare the armies of Western Europe to those of the Sultan. Quote, Once or twice a day on campaign, the Turkish soldiers drink a beverage made of water mixed with when available, A few spoonfuls of flour, a little butter, spices, and a piece of bread or ration of biscuit. Some of them take it with a little bag of powdered dried beef, which they use in the same way as flour. Sometimes they also eat the meat of their dead horses. All this will convey to you how patiently and abstemoniously the Turks confront difficult times and wait for better days. How different are our soldiers? who despise ordinary food and want delicacies, even on campaign. If we don't give them food like that, they mutiny and bring suffering on themselves. If we do give them such food, they still bring suffering on themselves. Each man is his own worst enemy and has no more deadly adversary than his own intemperance, which kills him off even if the enemy doesn't. I dread to think what the future holds for us when I compare the Turkish system to ours. End quote. He further goes on to summarize his opinion of the Turkish army as follows. Their discipline is far more and just and strict than that of the ancient Greeks and Romans. There are three reasons for their superiority over us in battle. They immediately obey their commanders. They never worry about the possibility of losing their lives and they can survive without bread and wine and a little barley and water, End quote. Needless to say, the Ottoman supply lines were very well organized. The permanent army was made up of slaves of the Porta. That Porta is the word that's often used interchangeably with the Ottoman central government. The two forces form the heart of this army. The Sifai, the cavalry, and the Janissaries, the most elite fighting force in the Turkish army. In the 15th century, the Janissaries numbered around 5,000. But under Suleiman, that number would grow to 12,000. Some historians tend to give the Janissaries still a significance that they never really possessed, at least not on the battlefield. Their role was to join the battle after the auxiliaries had worn down the opponent. Often, their fresh numbers tipped the scales. But politically, the Janissaries were crucial. No sultan could accede to the throne without granting a substantial gift to the Janissaries. By siding with a particular claimant to the throne, the Janissaries decided the fate of the empire on more than one occasion. Once the sultan sat atop the throne, the Janissaries' loyalty was absolute. They were ready to sacrifice their lives for him. In battle, they would form a line around the sultan. Now, at least through the 16th century, all the Janissaries were slaves and the property of the sultan, and all were of Christian origin. This practice dates back centuries. Each village throughout the empire, those with a significant Christian population at least, were required to provide a certain number of slave administers, and slave soldiers. Every boy between the age of 8 and 20 had to come forward at a given time for selection. Judges, called Qadi, would circulate and determine who might make the best administrators and soldiers. They were always from peasant families and never the only son. The boys were then sent to Istanbul in groups of 100, directed to either the barracks 
or the palace of the Pasha, or lead administrator. Young boys slated to join the Janissaries would usually go to Anatolia to work in large farms, until they were old enough to begin their training. Despite some criticism that the program got, it continued unabated through Suleiman's reign. All grand viziers, without exception, were Islamicized Christians until the great sultan's death. Of course, no army can be successful on its own. And at least from 1450 to 1550, the sultans who commanded the armies of Ottoman Islam were excellent. One contemporary said as follows, quote, No European dynasty produced ten sovereigns of such remarkable talents in two and a half centuries. Mehmet was the great conqueror of Constantinople. Selim had brought down the Mamluks. Now Suleiman would surpass them both. When looking back at Suleiman's early life, we know very little, which is not atypical for the age. Suleiman would have gone with his father, Selim, when he took up the important province of Trabzon on a crucial territory because it bordered Sahafid, Iran. We know next to nothing about Suleiman at this time because nothing at all indicated Selim had any real prospects of becoming sultan. Suleiman himself had brothers, how many we do not know whom he executed later on. His mother, Hafsa Hatun, is believed to have been the daughter of the Khan of the Crimean Tartars. She would have been about 17 years old at the time of Suleiman's birth. Importantly, through her, Suleiman could claim that the blood of the great Genghis Khan flowed through his veins. In his earliest years, Suleiman, like all other Ottoman nobles, would have been watched over exclusively by his mother in her household. When he reached the age of seven, his father would have taken charge of Suleiman's education. His education was thorough and well-rounded. Suleiman would have been taught to read the Quran, arithmetic, and music. He would have been introduced to horsemanship and archery. By the time he reached the age of 11, Suleiman would have been permanently removed from his mother's household, and his education would have become the purview of a trusted tutor. When he reached the age of 15, Suleiman was sent to Karhasi by Sultan Bezayid II, his grandfather to take up his post as imperial governor. Suleiman's uncle, Ahmed, the heir to the throne, thought his post was far too close to the capital. Instead, he contrived to get the boy sent to Balu, more distant, and therefore, from Ahmed's perspective, safer location. Finally, after all the negotiations, Suleiman left for Kaffa instead, in the Crimea, on August the 6th, 1509. There, he spent three years as governor. Kaffa was an important post. On the Black Sea, this former Genoan trading post received spices, silk, and cotton from the east on its way back over the Silk Road toward Europe. Mehmed II had conquered Kaffa back in 1475, and subsequently the sultan agreed to take on the Crimean Khan as a vassal. This was all still the status quo when Suleiman showed up in late 1509. From there, we already know part of the story. Two of Bezaid's sons died engaged in different machinations for the throne. The final three, Selim, Korkud, and Ahmed, were left to fight it out afterwards. It took three long years, but Selim achieved a total victory. One Selim achieved victory, he had Korkud and his children strangled. Ahmed was defeated in battle and then killed the same way. This was all when Suleiman was but 17. His father appointed him governor of Istanbul and then Manisa on the Aegean Sea. Other than a sojourn to Iran with his father, Suleiman did not leave his governorship until his ascension to power. As we know, Selim died suddenly while traveling from Istanbul to Edirne. Few people knew about his death, and all around agreed to keep it secret until Suleiman arrived. Everyone went along with this, including 
the powerful vizier is because everyone was afraid of what the Janissaries might do if word got out about the Sultan's death. Suleiman, no fool, waited for confirmation that his father was actually dead before setting out. A few future Sultans had done that now, and I guess it's worth mentioning why all the hesitancy. In their old age, some Sultans had given in to court gossip, specifically that their son or sons were plotting against them. So at different times during early Ottoman history, various sultans have leaked faked news as to their own death and then used their son's immediate and fast flight to the capital as evidence that they wanted their father to be dead. Of course, all this ignores the rampant fratricide that occurs when one was not the first to the capital. So sons had to often make a very difficult choice. Regardless, once Suleiman's fears were assuaged, he set out for Istanbul. When the Janissaries finally found out about Selim's death, they pouted a bit, but that was about all they could do. Suleiman, the heir, was at hand. The game was over. On September 30th, 1520, Suleiman reached the Asiatic side of the Bosphorus. The next morning, the Grand Vizier met him, ferried him across the straits, and greeted him as the new sultan. From there, Suleiman continued on towards Adirne, where he would be able to rejoin the funeral procession. Suleiman's first act as sultan was as expected. He made the usual gifts to the Janissaries. While he did not grant them the amount they wanted, Suleiman was willing to raise their pay and the rate of pay in the army in general across the board. Selim, for all his successes, allowed his policy to be driven in part by religious fanaticism. His son, Suleiman, by contrast, would practice clemency from the start and was, as one source reported, quote, like the heavenly dew on a sunny plain. Freedom of trade with Iran was re-established. Suleiman made it clear to everyone that he was going to be firm, but fair. His decisions would be governed by what was best for the realm, not what one or two zealots thought should be done. Suleiman practiced moderation in all things, as described by this Venetian envoy as follows. Quote, he now drinks no wine, only fair water on account of his infirmities. He has the reputation of being very just, and when he has been accurately informed of the facts of the case, he never wrongs any man. Of his faith and its laws, he is more observant than any of his predecessors. End quote. When Suleiman became sultan in 1520, he was 25 years old. One source gives him the following description, quote, He is tall but thin, with a delicate complexion. His nose is a little too long, his features fine, and his nose aquiline. He has the shadow of a mustache and a short beard. His general appearance is pleasing, although he is a little pale, end quote. Don't get me wrong. Suleiman was absolutely a pious Muslim, but he was completely unfanatical and more willing to tolerate Christians within the empire so long as they remained loyal and paid their taxes. Apart from that, the religion of his non-Islamic subjects was totally irrelevant to him. As always, when a new sultan, king, emperor, whatever, takes the reins, we can expect someone in some part of the empire, kingdom, burgeoning nation-state to rebel. Tale as old as time. This time, Suleiman's first rebellion came from Egypt. When Selim took the Mamluk holdings, he allowed one of the Mamluk viziers, who had betrayed the Mamluks to Selim, to remain in control. But this guy simply wasn't loyal to anyone, bottom line. So surprise, surprise. As soon as Selim died, he began conspiring to create his own empire for himself throughout the Levant. Egypt proper was in the hands of an Ottoman official, and this guy was stupid enough to reach out to him for an alliance against Suleiman. 
The Egyptian was only too happy to tell him to go ahead and attack Aleppo. He'd be right there to back him up. But, as the Ottoman official wrote this, he simultaneously wrote to Suleiman and told him all about the plans. The ex-Mamluk vizier tried to storm Aleppo to no avail. While he did this, Suleiman sent a trusted lieutenant with 40,000 troops, vastly outnumbering the vizier, and he smashed the former Mamluk in battle. The man died several days later trying to outstrip his pursuers. With the Egyptian rebellion over, Suleiman's position looked secure. So now it was time for him to turn his gaze west. Suleiman had been the heir apparent for years. Hence, he had already spent over a decade learning the intricacies of foreign diplomacy. Of particular importance to Suleiman were his relations with the fractious West. Long gone were the ideals of a united Christendom. European states like England, France, and a newly united Spain saw themselves as individual kingdoms, not as some collective to be negotiated with as a whole or through the papacy. Suleiman would take advantage of this massive change in attitude. Throughout his reign, he would continue the policy of the sultans who came directly before him. He would negotiate with each European state on its own. He would not negotiate with a Christendom that no longer existed. We know, for example, that Suleiman went to great lengths to try and meet with the Venetian representatives before anyone else. The sultan was also very aware of events in Europe. For instance, he was well-versed in Charles V's recent, one year prior, election as Holy Roman Emperor. He was aware that Charles was the most powerful man in Europe, at least on paper. But he also knew that Charles was massively in debt, and therefore unlikely to be able to undertake any major military expedition against him. Still, like all the sultans who came before him, above all else, what Suleiman wanted to avoid was a crusade. While that event might seem unlikely, truly it was, the fact of the matter remained that Suleiman did not want to provoke Europe into rising for a mass crusade. So it was always a question of how far he could expand, how much he could poke the bear, before he got the massive response he so badly wanted to avoid. It was a balancing act that previous sultans had done their best to walk. And now it was Suleiman's turn to try. The idea, at the very least, of a crusade was always present in the halls of power in the Ottoman world. Whatever their disagreements, the combined monarchies of Western Europe were always happy to at least indicate their agreement on one front. They wanted to make war against the hated Turk. And for Suleiman, the danger was all too real. Charles V now had, theoretically, more power than any European monarch has had for centuries. He was the German emperor, the king of Spain, the king of the two Sicilies, the ruler of the Low Countries and Austria. Like I said, on paper, very formidable. But as we know, in practice, it was almost impossible for him to marshal the full weight of the territories behind him. Now, if anything... I would say that Suleiman was much more focused on Europe than all of Europe ever was on him. At least on the main. Different popes and monarchs gave the Muslim threat more or less lip service over time. But if you look at a map of Europe, before and after Suleiman's reign, it's pretty clear who consistently focused on who. While Charles tended to focus on expanding his border in Spain to Morocco, 
he more or less left the Austrian border to his brother Ferdinand. And that was where Suleiman tried to take advantage, especially because Ferdinand and Charles rarely saw eye to eye on the defense of Austria. Charles had to look at the needs of his entire empire. Ferdinand always wanted Charles to focus more on Hungary, but that was only one aspect of Charles's domains. Things are going to change after Charles's death, when Spain slash Low Countries are forever severed from the other Habsburg holdings in Central and Eastern Europe. That's a story for another day. Frankly, between roughly 1520 and 1550, Europe and the Islamic world were almost constantly at war. What is fascinating is how most historians that focus on this period tend to ignore this reality. They focus instead on the conflict between Francis, Charles, and Henry VIII, or they focus on the Reformation. But in reality, the story of 1520 through 1550 is all about the Ottomans. There was a very real chance during these decades that Vienna would fall and Islam would spread throughout Central Europe. That such is not what happened is probably a bit more surprising than if it had. For Suleiman, the first objective was to take Belgrade. At the end of the 14th century, the Bulgar and Serbian kingdoms that had hitherto dominated the Balkans ceased to exist. In the following century, the Byzantines completely collapsed. This left Hungary as the sole remaining Christian power in the region. More often than not, if anyone was going to heed the papal calls for crusade going forward, it was going to be the Hungarians. Under John Hyundai and his son, Michael Corvinus, Hungary had replaced Constantinople as the new bulwark against the quote-unquote infidel in Central Europe. Corvinus had even hoped to launch a crusade against the Ottomans. But after his death in 1490, Hungarian power waned significantly. But Suleiman still needed a pretext for a war against Hungary. It did not take long for him to get it. In 1520, Hungary decided not only would it not pay its yearly tribute, but it would execute the ambassadors sent to get it for good measure. Suleiman jumped at the insult and declared war. Preparations took the whole winter of 1520, but by the spring, the armies of the Sultan were ready to march. Suleiman's objective remained Belgrade, then in Hungarian hands. Today, Belgrade is located in Serbia. The city itself sits on the nexus of the Danube and Sava rivers. Back then, it was a fortress city. The whole city itself is situated at a bend in the Danube, so the river can protect it on three-ish sides. The massive fortress within the city was located just over the bend in the river at a high outcropping of rock. Most believed it was impregnable. But if Suleiman could take it, then the path was open to march straight on to Buda and even Vienna. Now, King Louis of Hungary could do the same math. He recognized how devastating the loss of Belgrade would be to Europe as a whole. So he immediately wrote to anyone and everyone who would listen to aid. Europe's response was both predictable and disappointing. Venice was about to sign a lucrative trade deal with the Ottomans and declined to help. The papacy was too wrapped up with affairs in Italy. In Germany, Luther had now completely broken with the church leaving many to question whether or not it made more sense to spend time healing the religious divisions within Christendom before marching out to punish Christian enemies beyond it. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V advised King Louis to sign a truce with Suleiman to buy time. That would have been great advice. Had Suleiman had any interest in a peace treaty, which he did not, So it was that on February the 6th, 1521, Suleiman left Istanbul for the first time as sultan at the head of a great army. A Turkish army on the march would have been a sight not seen in Europe since the ages of Rome. 
most European armies marched in what could only be described as barely controlled chaos. Turkish armies, by comparison, looked like a well-oiled machine. Turkish troops always marched in strict order. They raised camp at dawn and stopped at noon, at a place chosen in advance where everything had been prepared for the arrival of the sultan and his entourage. Suleiman's army moved rapidly, quickly moving past Edirne and reaching Sofia in several days. Hiri Pasha had been chosen to lead the army. He reached the walls of Belgrade several weeks before the sultan and had the city well invested before Suleiman got there. For three weeks, Suleiman's men battered the walls. Finally, Suleiman ordered the citadel blown up. Even after, the Hungarians and Serbians continued to fight until the Ottomans offered the Serbians, only the Serbians, the right to surrender. They were attempting to play off the religious differences between the Orthodox Serbs and the Catholic Hungarians. And it worked. Much to the chagrin of the Hungarians, the Serbs surrendered and were allowed to relocate to Istanbul. The remaining Hungarians, desperately outnumbered, were slaughtered. Thus, by the spring of 1521, Belgrade was in Ottoman hands. Belgrade was a major stronghold and largely considered to be the gateway to Hungary. Once again, Europe shuddered as it considered the ramifications of the loss. Once again, from a practical perspective, the European monarchs did almost nothing. As Suleiman barely paused to catch his breath, I mean, within hardly a year from his ascension to the throne, and only a few months after the capture of Belgrade, the sultan had turned his sights on a totally different target. Rhodes. In 1480, Mehmet II had attempted to capture Rhodes and failed. Now, 40 years later, Suleiman was determined to put the Knights of the Hospital on that shelf of history that reads, defunct. There were very good reasons for Suleiman to turn his attention to Rhodes. Ever since the Knights Hospitaller had established themselves on the island in the 13th century, they had built up an effective power base from which they could plunder ports across Syria and Asia Minor. Most of the trade in the Ottoman Empire flowed from Egypt north to Istanbul and much of it by sea. The Knights, therefore, were much more than mere pesky flies. They were a pirate menace that needed to be dealt with. And so Suleiman decided he would deal with the order once and for all and wipe off the map a threat to his power, located only 15 miles or so from the coast of Asia Minor. Suleiman quickly surmised that no one in Europe was willing to lift a finger to help some aged, crusading order. No one, from Henry VIII to Charles V and Francis I, was willing to spare one man, one ship, one second, to defend the island. Francis did indicate a desire to help the Knights Hospitaller, but he was bankrupt and unable to make good on his promises. Really, the only power who might do something was Venice. Venice had a fleet powerful enough to make conquering roads difficult, if not impossible, for the sultan. Suleiman decided to silence the Venetians with the same trick that sultans always used to silence Venice. Money. Suleiman quickly struck a new 30-year trade deal with Venice, which was very favorable to Venetian shipping interests. As a consequence, Venice certainly would not be doing anything to impede an Ottoman invasion of Rhodes. The Venetians did send their fleet to shadow the Ottomans, but only to make sure that Venetian Cyprus was not the target. As soon as said fleet ascertained that Rhodes was the target, it sailed off, leaving the knights to their fate. Back in Rome, the impoverished Pope Adrian VI could only look on in despair.
As the fleet neared the island, Suleiman dispatched a letter to the knights calling on them to surrender. This sort of thing was a formality required under Islamic law. Cities then had a certain amount of time to surrender. If they did not, then their lives and property were considered forfeit. The knights were in a horrifyingly bad position. Suleiman's admiral commanded the fleet of 700 ships and 10,000 crack soldiers. The knights had around 650 members of the order, 300 Genoese and Venetian sailors, plus around 7,000 untrained men. On August the 1st, 1521, the Ottomans opened the hostilities. 21 cannons opened up on the German bastion. Each part of the city, as an aside, was defended by a different nationality. Keep in mind, we're talking about a holy order here, so there would have been contingents from across Europe, and it was important to get commands from someone who spoke your language. On September the 4th, the Ottomans created a breach in the English section of the walls, and attackers streamed in. The knights beat them back, however, and the Turks suffered nearly 2,000 men in casualties. Attacks continued like this with the Ottomans taking heavy losses, unable to produce anything close to a conclusive result. Suleiman was determined to take the city, and the knights were determined to play for time and hope Europe would come to its rescue. On September the 23rd, the Sultan called for an all-out attack. All around the walls, fighting men streamed forward at every weekend and every weak point they could find. Even the vaunted Janissaries got into the mix. But once more, the knight somehow threw the defenders back. The combat had gone on all day and produced no result. According to one historian I read, at this point, Suleiman has lost more than 45,000 men, which is a clear exaggeration given that that's more men than he took to Rhodes in the first place. Still, we cannot doubt that his losses at this point had been staggering. On October the 12th, the Ottomans tried the English section of the walls again. This time, the leader of the Janissaries was injured in the battle, forcing Suleiman to call off the attack. On November 30th, the Sultan tried the Spanish and Italian sections of the walls, but the only result was another 3,000 dead Turks. After all these failed attempts, Suleiman made another offer to the Grand Master of the Order. He told him that if the town were turned over to the Ottomans in three days, then the garrison could go free. If not, quote, not even the cats would be spared. At this point, it had been over four months since the siege began. There did not appear to be any realistic hope that any Western Christian nation was going to send aid to the dying military order. Though they had fought valiantly, the Grand Master of the Knights of the Hospital determined that they could not keep this up much longer. He decided to capitulate and hope that Suleiman was telling the truth. The Grand Master's terms were as follows. One, the garrison would leave in 12 days, leaving behind 50 hostages. And two, for five years, the Christian population on roads would be exempt from taxation or compulsory military service. During this time, they could decide whether to remain under Ottoman rule or leave for Western Europe. Suleiman agreed. And no doubt he was genuine. The problem was the Janissaries had suffered significantly during the siege and they wanted revenge. As soon as they were in the city, they ran amok, killing and looting indiscriminately. It took Suleiman a full day to get them under control. The departure of the Latin knights and their followers left Rhodes severely depopulated and Suleiman would need to spend the next decade importing settlers from the Balkans and Anatolia to take their place. News of the fall of Rhodes was greeted in Europe with the now usual feelings of grief and consternation. As an aside, I do wonder if there's a point here when somebody pointed out to the people of Venice or France or England that if they continued to do nothing, then the result was always going to be the same. Whether Constantinople or Belgrade or Rhodes... If Europe refused to send aid that none of these places on their own was going to be able to stand up to the Ottomans, not now, 
Thanks to his artillery prowess, Suleiman now controlled the most powerful military in the world. The enormous Turkish guns, ironically often built with Christian help, and new, the most up-to-date techniques. They had the equivalent of the machine gun in an age when everyone else was still using muzzle-loading firearms. Worse still, because of their aggressive conquests, the Ottomans were able to seize guns from their opponents. Between 1521 and 1541, over 5,000 guns were seized from battlefields in Hungary alone. But most of the Ottoman artillery was produced in-house. The vast majority of the gunnery in the empire was produced in the foundry district in Istanbul. By Suleiman's time, there were probably around 1,000 artillery pieces as a whole throughout the empire. That absolutely dwarfed anything that Henry VIII, Charles V, or Francis I could put into the field. Frankly, he had more than all those monarchs combined. In terms of military technology, the Ottomans were the superpower of the 16th century. It was also their firepower, as we have seen, that made the Ottomans the superior rulers over their Islamic counterparts. In the 16th century, the Ottomans were at the forefront in military technology. Their ultimate decline was brought about in part by their failure to stay on top, to assume that what was the best technology in 1550 would be the best in 1850. That, my friends, is a good lesson to learn from history. But for now, no one could stand up against the combination of Turkish cannons and their vaunted janissaries. Now, I do want to pause here and discuss another side note in terms of the Ottoman military, and that's the Timur system. The Timur system was the system by which the Ottoman sultans raised cavalry, and they had probably also the most effective cavalry in the world at this point. The Janissaries were elite, but they were gunners and infantrymen, and the army still needed cavalry, especially for the wide plains of Hungary. The solution was to parcel out land like fiefs in the feudal system, in return for military service. The men who took this land were called Timurats. These Timurats were essentially just feudal knights. They could farm the land themselves or have local peasants farm it and collect taxes, which is, of course, what they did. The sultan could cancel the agreement and replace them at any time if they failed to show up when called, so you had better show up. Moreover, you needed to bring your own army with you. Depending on how large the timmer, or land, was, and how productive, determined by your tax bill, you were required to show up with a certain number of foot soldiers, plus your own tent, kitchen, etc. All the material needed for a campaign was determined in advance. Each man, therefore, knew exactly what to bring for each one. Some timorates brought whole squadrons of potentially up to 1,000 foot soldiers but the amounts varied dramatically by who you were. The Timur system was grounded in a fundamental principle of the Ottoman Empire. Land belonged to the state. Individuals could be granted land in exchange for some form of service, but the land always belonged to the state. This is part of what I meant earlier when I mentioned that the Ottoman administration was really geared to warfare. Everybody fought in the Ottoman Empire in some fashion. Some fought directly, others fought by producing the goods necessary to feed and provision the army, but everyone had a part. Now, the Timur system was not pure feudalism. In feudalism, the fief always, most times, passed on to the son. A son in the Ottoman Timur system might be able to inherit his father's land if he belonged to the state military, or if he was one of the sultan's slaves. But either way, he would need to get the administration's approval. It did not happen automatically. Once the son had the land, he had to constantly prove to the administration that he deserved it. Land could be taken back due to a failure to appear for military service, cowardice in battle, treason, impiety, or the ill treatment of peasants. Frankly, the sultan gave the land, and he could take it back whenever he wanted. And unlike in feudal Europe, the sultan had cannons 
and the Timoret did not. So the fief holder had very little choice in what he did. In addition to the Timorets, there were the Knights of the Port, also called the Sephai, or Men of the Six Regiments. These were the truly elite lords of the land, and there were very few of them. There were, of course, more numerous foot soldiers who just lived off the spoils from any conflict. These varied dramatically, depending on where you were. For example, there were about 15,000 standing scimitar-wielding foot soldiers spread throughout Asia, and about 30,000 horsemen stationed on the border with Europe. Thus, it's important to understand that the Ottoman Empire used a kind of hybrid-style army. It was part medieval. The Timurids were certainly medieval in nature. They mustered when they were called, brought their gear, and generally did what they wanted. On the other hand, the Janissaries and artillerymen were totally professional. This push and pull would cause cracks in the system as centuries progressed. And against this foe was... Well, Europe's B-team, for sure. European armies were, by and large, still very medieval in the early modern period. Moreover, a burgeoning sense of nationalism meant that men were quite unwilling to fight anywhere outside their home kingdom. German soldiers, for example, outright refused to fight in Hungary during this period. They thought the food was too bad, at least according to one source. Really, the only person who might, and I do mean might, have been able to challenge Suleiman was Charles V. But as we know, he was far too often preoccupied with either Francis I or Martin Luther to do anything constructive on the Ottoman front. And so that's where we'll leave it for today. If you're interested in more content, you can check out the website at westerncivpodcast.com. For ad-free versions of the show and additional content, check out the Patreon page patreon.com forward slash Western Civ Podcast. And if you'd like to do the whole thing over again, but with better sound quality and more detail, check out a free trial of Western Civ 2.0. It's the whole thing, but with a lot better quality. Ooh.